When we look at economic and social systems we use, and rightly so, different measures of evaluating whether they are proceeding on a trajectory that is leading to the desired outcomes that we want from them. In the case of an economic system, uh, one of the most important criteria that we use is if the system is efficient. Efficiency is its ability to produce a certain amount of output per unit of input, whether the input is energy and the output is uh, a product or a service, whether the input is money and the output is profit or uh, return on the, the investment. And this efficiency, if taken as the main or sole indicator of the correct set of parameters that can influence the nature of the economic system can have secondary effects. And these secondary effects are often not measured. They are not taken into account into the uh, value that the economic system creates. Um, let me give you a, a, a couple of examples. In, in the uh, 90s, uh, Dell Computers became very valuable as a company and it was uh, pointed as a, an example of just-in-time production system. A just-in-case uh, warehouse will store uh, a lot of components in order to make sure that it is ready to produce what is required. A just-in-time production system instead relies on its ability to predict what is going to be needed and it is not uselessly tying up capital in storing parts that will not be needed for some time. So Dell obviously adopted a just-in-time production system and not only uh, it imposed on itself certain criteria for the turnaround of uh, the components, but it required from its suppliers to be able to ship whatever Dell needed in a very, very short amount of time. Not weeks, not days, hours. So everybody was looking at Dell and how efficient its production system was. And not a lot of people realized that the secondary effect of this was for the suppliers to physically locate their own warehouses close to the Dell production facility with its own just-in-time warehouse that was the minimum necessary, and that these warehouses of the suppliers themselves may or may not have been as efficient as the Dell system. And what happened, uh, if you want to put it that way, is that Dell was pushing the complexity and the responsibility of managing the warehouse outside of its own systems, but it wasn't really eliminating it. It wasn't making the whole system more efficient if you also include in the definition of the whole system the warehouses of uh, its uh, suppliers. And a second example, of course, very easily identified can be that of globalization's effect on the length of these supply chains. We have examples of uh, um, partially complete products traveling the world maybe multiple times while different specialized steps in the production process are completed and even though it should be the case because it should be reflected in the cost of transportation 
a lot of the externalities in these very long supply chains are not incorporated in evaluating them uh, as desirable. They may be efficient, otherwise they wouldn't be used. Each of the participating uh, uh, components is able to add uh, its own value to the process. But especially if we look at the Earth system as the one that we must understand and analyze to decide if the process is desirable, if these tran transportation steps do not incorporate uh, the cost on the environment of the transportation itself, then we are misleading ourselves in looking at it as optimal or close to optimal. But probably the most important point, the point that I want to make today around the maximization of efficiency against everything else is that these systems can be brittle. They can be disrupted with no or very little fallback mechanisms and the, their ability to withstand the effect of variations of conditions that go beyond a fairly narrow path is what makes them brittle. The opposite of this, of course, that of resilient systems. We want systems to be resilient in order to be able to withstand extreme variations in the conditions under which they must function. And the reason we want resilient systems is because we know that there are conditions that we can't control. There will be disruptions. There will be disruptions in the environment. There will be disruptions in the uh, operations of our uh, competitors that come up with uh, unexpected um, actions. There will be disruptions caused by political upheavals which are especially relevant if we are talking about supply chains that in a globalized world um, span multiple continents. And of course, as it is happening these days, as I am recording this episode of The Context, there will be disruptions caused by unexpected health-related upheavals, as we are seeing today with the COVID-19 epidemic, which in the next few days may or may not be reclassified as a pandemic instead. The possibility of balancing appropriately the two different criteria, efficiency on one hand, resiliency on the other is itself an extremely desirable meta layer in evaluating whether a given economic or political or social system uh, is optimal or is going in a direction that we see optimal. So as we are looking at trying to find the right balance between uh, these two ways of, of organizing uh, our lives and our activities, we can also look at how technology is enabling certain uh, steps. The uh, innovation that we see in technology is most often evaluated given how more efficient it makes certain processes. There are uh, ways of measuring how many um, uh, 
watts per hour, for example, uh, or sorry, watt hours, uh, the transportation of uh, a certain mass uh, requires and whether it is more efficient uh, to transport it uh, with horses or with cars or with airplanes, um, whether uh, the storage, uh, the uh, dissemination of knowledge is more efficient uh, using uh, uh, just um, uh, our uh, ability to memorize and to vocalize uh, the knowledge, or it is more efficient uh, using uh, books or computers and the internet. And as innovation progresses, new degrees of efficiency, orders of magnitude more efficient systems can be found and are found that are unlocking the opportunities and the ability to create new products and services. But also, very importantly, they make resiliency affordable. We are able to say, do we really need 10 times as efficient production of something? Or can we instead put in place more redundant systems so that we distribute and decentralize our production and we make sure that it can withstand extreme variations in conditions better than a system where certain steps are only supported by one set of the production facility and as a consequence is, is less resilient. So the new degrees of efficiency can be deployed for more efficient production or on the other hand can be deployed for a, a greater degree of redundancy. One of the systems where we can see this choice being played out over the course of millennia is our social political organization. Was it the case that uh, slavery was moral uh, under the Romans? It wasn't, but Roman slaves were at the time necessary in order to carry out a lot of the activities that otherwise wouldn't happen. Are we morally superior to the Romans because we outlawed slavery? Probably not, but we can afford that morally superior position because of the technology advances that we have achieved in the meantime. And as we look at the inefficiencies of our political system, we have to look at whether the inefficiency is a consequence of some current inability of managing certain steps in the system and how an increased efficiency in managing that could be turned into a better political organization that may be more efficient or even though it is not more efficient, uses that increased efficiency to increase its resiliency, to increase its decentralization and robustness. The devolution of political power, for example, uh, is an indication of this. How within the European Union, for example, the decision-making process, rather than being centralized at a highest level, is made at the lowest possible level for that kind of decision-making. And the objective of so many political decisions, of achieving a consensus, rather than being able to, for example, maximize the number of laws that uh, are being passed, is itself a cost that we happily 
support and sustain because we can afford it. Democracy is inefficient, but we are happy to pay for that inefficiency. A dictatorial system is much more efficient, but also is able to go down on a path of extremely wrong-headed decisions. It is going to be very efficient in, for example, starving millions or tens of millions of people to death, like it happened in China during the Cultural Revolution, because of how convinced it was of its own decisions and how efficient it was in carrying out those decisions and spreading them out across society, never looking back, never being able to re-evaluate its own actions, its own decisions in the chaotic, um, confusionary, contradictory, uh, and inefficient process of a democratic consensus making mechanism. People often criticize Bitcoin because it wastes energy. These people never compare the energy invested in supporting a global trustless network of financial transactions with the system that is in place today of printing, distributing, managing, collecting, destroying, protecting, falsifying money, paper money, turning trees into money, having armed guards in uh, armored cars, transporting dead pieces of paper from one place to another. The energy cost of that system is huge and it is never put in comparison with uh, the cost of the energy of the Bitcoin network. However, the Bitcoin network is inefficient itself on purpose because the purpose of the Bitcoin network is not that of the most efficient use of energy in order to support a financial transaction. We already have many centralized transaction systems that are very efficient. The purpose of the Bitcoin network is to maximize resiliency, robustness, ability to withstand extreme disruptions and carry out its purpose nonetheless. So look how other systems that surround you are balancing efficiency and resiliency and whether the balance that those systems are striking corresponds to one, your expectations, two, your own goals, and if there is a discrepancy, what can you do in order to evolve those systems to arrive to a better desirable balance? So what are these systems? Well, energy. How is energy produced and consumed and distributed in the place where you live? Food. Is food global, enjoying incredible variety? but coming through extremely long uh, supply chains, or is food local or even produced by you in your garden, in your hydroponic system, uh, in your indoor garden? Health. Is uh, health tourism a desirable ability that we now can rely on, uh, seeking the lowest cost, highest quality treatment wherever it is uh, in the world? Is health better maintained through local practices and local traditions, uh, local ability to find complementary ways to achieve wellness and well-being? 
Is the school system very efficient in um, disciplining and organizing the pupils' lives in order to produce obedient adults? Or is our ability to learn a variety of subjects and a variety of stimulating, interesting, and valuable skills coming from many other sources, including the school system, but not exclusively in a relationship that may be less efficient, but is more resilient, and so on. We can and have to better understand the relationship between two, these two very important factors that are impacting our lives and our societies.